I'm going to uh, do my best not to fall like I fell into the baptistry there. I, I was almost rebaptized myself this morning. So, and is my microphone on? <laughs> it probably is now, thank you. Hey, we don't have a particular passage of scripture to turn to this morning, but before we get started, I want to say that uh, this morning's not going to be like any typical morning at church. Um, Today is our annual meeting Sunday, and typically in the past, at a lot of annual meetings, it sets a lot of churches. If this is your only church you've ever been to, please understand that most churches are the same. But it sets a lot of churches up uh, to find and, and dig in on the things that are wrong with church. And the fact is, is that we can all dig in on things that are wrong because there's something wrong with all of us. I find that it's kind of easier to dig in on the things that are wrong that other people do, but oftentimes we fail to look in the mirror and see the things that are wrong with us. And so I thought for, for an annual meeting Sunday, what if, what if we could take annual meeting Sunday and point forward, point forward to what we want to try to accomplish in the next year, you know, point forward to the things that God has called us to do. But before we do that, I just want to say one thing. We had an opportunity to witness this morning three young people take a step in their journey of faith. And I would be remiss, and I, I think that it would not be what God would want me to do to pass up on the opportunity to say, this morning you're not going to hear a typical sermon, but I want you to hear the gospel. Here's the gospel. We're all sinners. Every single one of us at the core of who we are have sinned and we fall short of what God has required of us or what he desires for us to glorify him. But here's the great thing about that. Isaac read the verse in his his testimony. For God so loved the world, that means he loves you, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. And so you have that opportunity today as well, not to walk out of here or to walk out of here with hope, not with judgment, to walk out of here with a promise not, not of, of glory, not a promise of condemnation. And so this is simple. The text was clear. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he will save you. He will seal you with his Holy Spirit, and you can walk out of here today a brand new person. If you've come into the room this morning and that's a step that you need to take, please, please understand. That's why we do everything that we do. As a matter of fact, that's why we are going to launch into sharing this vision of what we would like to see accomplished through the First Baptist Church of Linesville next year. This vision can only be accomplished when every single one of us as followers of Christ determine that we are going to be committed to do what God has called us to do. So that's what we're going to be doing this morning is sharing a vision for next year. And before I go any further, Pastor Terry, would you pray for us? I will. God, we just bless your name this day the name of Jesus Christ, and thank you for the opportunities that you are already opening to us as a body of believers. God, I would pray that we would keep our focus, our eyes, our ears, our determination upon you, God. We would focus upon the Word of God because you have laid out the plan for each of us in the Word. And I pray that we would, we would just go to the Word daily and looking to you and, and to see what you would have for us. And God, we thank you for what you are going to accomplish even this day today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the First Baptist Church of Lyonsville can be traced back to March 11th of 1851. This means that in the next year and a half, this church will have served this community for a total of 150 years. Let that sink in. You know, the fact is, is that when God designed the local church, God never intended the local church to be the thing that lasted forever. Think about all the churches that have started and stopped in that amount of time frame. And the Lord, for some reason, known only to him, continues to desire to work through this body of believers to reach this community. He's left for us this opportunity that started back on March 11th of 1851. Do you ever wonder what the hopes and dreams of those initial members were? That's the way my mind likes to work. When the people sat down, they started having their Bible studies, just like every church starts. They start having Bible studies in homes, and they decide, here's what we desire for the church to be. And and, and I don't think it's kind of taking too much liberty for me to begin to dream along with them of what their dreams possibly would have been. Here's what I think. I believe that they wanted a place right here in Linesville. Was it Linesville then? 
Okay, I wanted to play something, I thought it was, in Lionsville, that the gospel could be proclaimed from a group of people who gather together for the purpose of mission. So that was their first and foremost desire. I also believe that they wanted to design a place, the church, in which families could come together, that they could worship, that they could read God's word together, that they could raise their families together in the gospel, and that they could serve this community together. And I also believe that they desired to be a group of people who brought glory to God. Over the years, God has blessed the work of Linesville, or the First Baptist Church in Linesville. And the most recent history of this church can be traced back to 1987. It was in 1987 that Pastor Art Barnes was hired. I clicked on our Facebook Live feed a minute ago, and I saw that he had started watching the feed. I don't know if he still is. Uh, But uh, for those of you that were here before Pastor Art and have come along after him, you know the tremendous impact that his ministry had on this church. So let me just, just really quick. If you started attending church here after the ministry of Pastor Art, could you raise your hand? How about before Pastor Art? It's about half and half. He had a great, min- a great impact here. Pastor R drove by this empty property that this building currently sits on, and he realized that it would be a great place for a church, and so he, he organized the purchasing of this property, and on September the 1st of 2001, the building that the church met in, and I say that that way on purpose, because the church is not a building. The building that the church met in was burnt down. It was destroyed by a fire. And for nearly two years, the church met at the school while phase one of this building was being completed. And in June of 2002, the church marched from the old location, uh, the facility, um, to this facility to begin to serve the community. Nearly 10 years ago, uh, the, the fellowship hall was built as another means of doing just that. The recent history of this church, uh, we've we've kind of talked about and touched on. The recent history of this church, just like all churches, has gone through some struggles, some trial. And there's a reason why that's the case. It's because of this. It's because of this stuff that we all carry around. We all carry around this sinful flesh that we battle with daily. But here's the thing that I really marveled at when I began to talk to the church leaders or the, the pulpit committee before I got here is that for God held on to this place. He held on to this place through the people that are here, through the people who have decided that no matter what, this was going to be family. And now I believe that we are poised to go forward with the mission that God has left us with to reach this community for the gospel. I really believe it. And here's one of those things I really believe. I believe that we, this group of people that call this place their home, can reach their neighbors with the gospel message. And once their neighbors are reached with the gospel message, I believe that their neighbors will be reached and that we can have a revival that can begin to take place right within this community because here's what I believe, and we're gonna go through this when we go through the book of Romans, there's power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the power of salvation for everyone who believes. God's word is true, and it is real, and it will happen. We've just got to be convicted by that. We spent the last five weeks going over church membership, and we made five, we, five I will statements. I will be a functioning church member. I will be a unifying church member. I will be a selfless church member. I will be a thankful church member. I will be a devoted church member. And before we move forward uh, with the statements that I would like for us to all agree upon this morning, Just a quick reminder from that series. The church is not a building. It's not. The Lord could take this property away from us tomorrow and the true church would still be able to meet together. Hmm. Last week, Pastor Terry did a great job sharing in the last sermon for our series and he showed a video right at the beginning of that. And I, I can't tell you, not only was Pastor Terry's sermon impactful for me, but that video was impactful for me as well because he said two things, if you'll remember. He said, stained glass can't pray for people. These walls can't proclaim the gospel. It's us that we have to do that. So in the beginning of the series, in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 27, we read and we learned that the church is a body and every, every member, every person has to carry out their part. Every person has a role to play in that. You know, the foot, the hand, the mouth, the feet, I mean, the, everything. All of us have a play, but there's one, a, a part to play. There's one thing that he said in there that really still stands out into my mind. He says, and we are individually members of God's body. That means every single one of us have a responsibility to one another. We have a responsibility to carry this gospel message out to the ends of the earth, and it will go further through us as a whole if we will do that. So I'm going to get out of the way, and I'm going to let Pastor Terry begin to carry us on our first 
uh, um, vision statement that we want. Here's what we're asking. We had a 2020 vision. We're calling it plus one. And so we're asking you to add one thing to 2020. And we'll begin to go over those things right now. Pastor Terry. Fifteen years ago, I had a great opportunity of being involved in my first life group. And it was with three other gentlemen. And uh, we did not realize it at the time, but we were going to be going through a very, very difficult time within our church. Not this church, but it was another church that I was involved in. And uh, originally, when we met, I was going through a, a study book and I was so excited, I was so on fire that I shared with the other guys in the group about what I was reading, the book that I was reading, it was, and it was a book entitled Wild at Heart by John Eldridge. And so the three of them got together and uh, they said, well, we're gonna have Terry lead the group. To my surprise, I knew nothing about it. And so we started meeting on Monday mornings every week at six o'clock and uh, we would pray together we would share together we would study the word of god together but it was a very very crucial time within our church there were some heartbreaking moments within our church and it was during that time that god worked in a tremendous way in my life and I am so very, very thankful for it. But it started 15 years ago that I felt very, very strongly that every person, myself included, should be involved in a group. Because it's there that you grow. It is there that you increase in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and the knowledge of His Word. And uh, there was one Monday morning in particular. One of the guys in the group, he was, he was on the floor. He was crying his heart out that day because of things that were going on in the church. And he was broken. But it was one of the sweetest times that I remember. When we came here to Lionsville First Baptist Church, about 13 years ago, my wife and I still felt that strong passion that we should be continuing to be involved in a group, with, whether it was here at the church, in an office, or in one of the classrooms, or whether it was in our house, because we felt that was so important in a person's life. And I don't know if you've ever had that opportunity to be involved in a grow group. It will change your life. And I've heard excuses over and over again. Well, I, I just don't feel comfortable being involved in a grow group. I don't feel comfortable sharing with other people. I would challenge you to do this. Go to a grow group and you don't even have to say a thing. You can just sit there in the corner. We've had certain people do that, haven't we, Kim? <laughs> yes, we've had certain people, they just sit in the corner. And week after week, you see God working and stirring in their hearts and life. But not only does He stir in their hearts and lives, he stirs in my heart. He stirs in my wife's heart and life. And I've heard preachers say this. One of the most important things that you can do in a grow group is get an opportunity to pray with somebody and to let that other person know that you care about them. Because sometimes on a Sunday morning in the main worship service, we cannot do it. We don't have time to do it. And so we need to take that time. But I will say this, 99% of those people 
that have been involved in my life group or grow group or they've been involved in they've been involved in mine or I've been involved in theirs I could call them any time day or night and they would be there for me because they care about me they're growing with me and I must say this it's not always easy sometimes it can get a little bit messy because somebody's going through a really, really hard time. But they're there to share with you, and you are there to share with them. And sometimes it's not even words. Sometimes it's tears. I have a passage of Scripture, and it's found in Hebrews 10, starting at verse 24. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. God has placed upon my heart for this coming year, 2020, that I would put more of my life and more of myself into grow groups because I feel that is so vital and so important for our church. And maybe you're sitting there this morning and you say, man, I feel like God's leading me to be in charge of a grow group. You need to follow that call. You need to follow that leading because God can do great things in your life because of that. And if you're sitting there this morning and you say, I I really need to be involved in something like that, we are going to give you some opportunities coming up in January that you can sign up for a grow group, that you can be involved in a grow group. And I encourage you to take those opportunities. Does anybody you, uh, understand what uh, interval training is? You know, you're on a treadmill, elliptical. Yes. Uh, you walk for about a minute slow, and then you walk for 30 seconds fast. So you're getting some interval training with your ears right now. Uh, Pastor Terry talking, and then Pastor Larry coming up right after and talking. So, so we want to ask you that commitment. Slow and fast. We want to ask you that commitment of will you, will you give one hour a week to discipleship training, Sunday school class, grow group, something. In this church, outside of this church, I know there's some people that are meeting with people that are, go to other churches. Hey, that's great. That's exactly what we want. Mm-hmm. Second thing, we want to ask you to give one hour a week of serving. One hour a week of serving. It's the role of the pastor to prepare the people in the church for works of service. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. It's not our role as pastors to do the work, but oftentimes that's one of the things that's expected of a pastor. And not just a pastor, but a pastor's wife. So you hire a pastor, okay, the pastor will do it. And if the pastor won't do it, the pastor's wife will do it. And and what I've learned in our church, it it extends out just a little bit more to our secretaries. Mm. So uh, here's what has to happen. We've got to take responsibility for what we've been given uh, from the Lord to use for his sake because he's given us a gift. I love what Romans chapter 6 or chapter 12 verses 6 through 9 says. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have the gift of showing kindness, kindness to others. Do it gladly. Don't, I love this, the way the New Living Translation says this one. Don't, (laughs) don't just pretend to love others. Whew. Let that sink in for a moment. Man, because when we really love people, when we really love people, we take what God has given us, what he's put here, what he's put here, what he's put here, here. We take it and we just want to give it to as many people as possible. Just want to give it out. Who can I give this to? So we're asking you this one thing. Will you put your yes on the table with service? Will you declare right now that you're going to have one hour of service? Once again, it can be here in this church. It can be in our community, which would be even cooler. Uh, it can be where in your schools, no matter where it's at. Will you just say, for one hour a week, I'm going to seek to serve other people. We've got plenty of opportunities in this church. Mm. There are plenty right here. 
but there are also plenty right around our community. There's plenty in your school place. There's plenty where you work. Where can you make a difference for the gospel by being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ? Listen, we have multiple opportunities, like I said, but, but not only do we grow through Bible studies, we also grow when we serve. And the fact is, is that when we decide to serve together, mm. when we connect with somebody else to serve together with them, something really special happens. We get connected in a great way. Some of my best friends in life still come from the Johnstown Christian Church. You know, I spent nine and a half years of ministry there. I want to be here longer. And, and listen, those people that I still point to, that, that I love, that I could call today and say, hey, I need you here, and they would get in the car and, and start working on getting here, here's what's happened. We went to church camp together for 10 years, and we served a week at church camp. We started serving at a food pantry in Columbus, and those same group of people decided, hey, yes, I'll help as well. You know, for some people that look from the outside in, they might have called us a clique. You know, we were a group of people who loved one another and loved the Lord and sought to serve whatever way we could. So we're asking you to do the same. Will you give one hour of service a week for the sake of the gospel message? Now you get to slow down again. <laughs> a little bit here. So... I would like you to pray for that one person that you feel that God has laid upon your heart that they would come to know Jesus. As you drive by their house, as you get up in the morning, and maybe you see their children out in the yard, or you are just reminded in the middle of the night about their name, their name comes to mind, that you would begin to pray, God, how can I influence that person for Jesus Christ? Prime example would be this. My wife has this great thing that she does almost after every single one of our grow groups. We have much food left over. Terry and Joy do not need the calories or the carbs. So she has people on our street that she gives that food to. She knows certain ones are not Christians. They do not know the Lord. We are looking for those opportunities that we can bring them to Christ, that we can share Christ with them. There is a great passage of Scripture in Matthew 4, and it says this in verse 18, One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. And Jesus called out to them, and he said, Come, follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. I will make you fishers of men. Every single one of us in here are gifted in many different ways. These two were fishermen. And Christ says, I will show you how to use your gifts to fish for people, to fish for men. I encourage you, have that one person in mind for this year. They're the one person that you would love to see them come to Christ. If it's more than one, if it's two, three, then praise God for that. But please have that one vision that I would love to see that person come to Christ. Pray for that person. Have your children pray for that person because we want them to come to Jesus. Truth be told, I thought about making this this morning one uh, a whole se series of sermons because there's so much to touch on. Uh, and the fact <coughs> is, is that we're asking you for that one, you know, to, to commit to sharing the gospel with one person in 2020. Starts with prayer and stays with commitment, and each of us have one person that we can do that with. Uh, I am here today because somebody shared the gospel with me at Simmons Company. That's where it started. It started to create an interest in me, 
And then from there, I met April, and after meeting April, I met her parents, and just really, my, the, my whole life, I knew I needed to understand who God was and give my life to him, but nobody explained it to me. There are people around that are the same way. Last commitment. Before I go any further here, uh, we are asking, I'm just going to put it out there, we are asking that you would uh, pray about and consider giving $1,000 over and above your tithe to pay off our debt on the fellowship hall. I know it sounds like a lot, and I'm also fully aware of the fact that there are people in this room that you hear that, and your initial thought is, I can't. And you're right, you can't. For those of you that can't, please understand that what I'm about to share is in no way, shape, or form trying to bring any kind of guilt or anything else upon you. Uh, When I was uh, interviewed, uh, one of the goals that was given to me by the Board of Trustees was that we attempt to pay off the debt on our fellowship hall in two years. At that point, it was $124,000 is what that debt was. Um, So here's what I began to do. I began to dream about, well, what could happen if we could do that in 2020? Right now, we owe roughly $117,000 on our mortgage debt on our fellowship hall. I inquired about the amount of giving units that we have in our church, meaning individuals and families who give, and I was informed that we have 149 different giving units in our church. Uh, And so I'm, I'm not a very smart guy, and I can only do simple math uh, so I decided to take uh, the, what we owed and with our giving units and then divide that uh, by a, a certain amount and then divide that by 52 and say, well, what if, what if we as a church could come together and pay off this debt next year? And, and the re- number is $15. So if, if we could give $15 a week over and above um, what we give for our tithe, then we could pay off our, our debt next, uh, this next year. So Here's something else that's just happened. We just recently repaired our parking lot. I think it was $26,000. We have a furnace that we need to repair. Uh, I don't know what that's going to cost. Uh, so if we could do the 20, you know, the, um, what I'm going to suggest, uh, then we could raise $154,960. We could pay off our debt, and we could put roughly about $40,000 in our improvement, building improvement fund because a building always needs work. So here's what we can do with that if we do that. Because everybody right now is just hearing money and dollar figures. And truth be told, I hate talking about money. I do. It's one of those things that people come in, that, yep, came to church, and last thing, they start talking about money. Please, please understand. Please understand uh, that we're talking to people who call this place their home, and we're calling members, family members, uh, to share the load. But here's what we could do. Imagine what could happen if we could free that up and begin to take the money that we're sending to a bank and start to support more missionaries. Hmm. More missionaries that are either local, local things that need to take place, not just local things, things that are taking place in our state, state, uh, crisis pregnancy centers that we could help support or maybe even buy a new machine for in the next year by, if we could re- rearrange some of that money. Imagine what could happen if we could take what we are doing right now and something that we as a church desperately need. I re- when I say desperately, please understand, God can do whatever he wants through whoever he wants, whenever he wants Uh, however he wants. So he can do that. But I think we, as a church, we would benefit from the hiring of a full-time family pastor family that could come in and help us to, uh, to strengthen and equip what's taking place in our elementary ministries all the way through our junior high and senior ministries. And that would be one of the things that we could begin to try to dream about and do the next year if we could just get this debt uh, paid off and, and behind us. For now, one of the changes that we're going to make in January, our EDGE youth group, which is currently ninth through 12th grade, is going to become 7th through 12th grade. We're going to have games, food, a large group lesson, and then we're going to break up into two, two discussion groups. That's what our goal for now. So, but, but it would be great to be able to begin to have this. So here's the big goal. The big, wildly important goal, or hairy, audacious goal, depending upon what leadership books you read, it's this. Are you able to add $1,000 to your tithes and offerings for the year of 2020? For some, it will be no problem at all. For some of us, we could do it. For others, it will be a gigantic stretch. You're not going to be able to do it. And please understand, that's okay. That's okay. It is. So once we ask, are you able? Now the second question is, are we willing? Are we willing to do that? And if we can do it in one year, that's $20 a week over and above what we typically give. If we can do it in two years, that's $10 a week over and above what we typically give. 
I really believe, I really believe that once we, can, once we would get past that and we can free up what God has blessed us with, because really these are God's blessings, he wants us using the money that we have for direct frontline ministry. And I think that this will put us in a place that we can make that happen, but we can do it together as a body of believers. So I want you to know, for April and I, this is going to be a stretch, but for April and I, this is something that we're going to commit to uh, ourselves. Uh, it's something that I've asked all of our leaders to pray about and commit to. Um, and so we're asking as a body of believers, are you able, are you able to give over and above the next year, if not the next year, the next two years, $1,000 above your tithe and offering so that we can pay off this debt and we can free up that money for frontline ministry so that we can really begin to see the gospel proclaimed more and more and more uh, through that. That's the last one. So here's what 2 Corinthians 9, 7 through 10 says. You must each decide in your heart how much you will give. I love the way Paul just cuts right to the chase with this, right? Because uh, uh, I, I want to tell you, I, I, know, I know we're going over, we had the baptisms, and so we're going to go over this morning. It's going to be a little bit different. I want to tell you that oftentimes in my life, in my own life, the last thing that was converted was my tithing. It was the last thing. You know, I was serving, I was preaching, I was doing all kinds of stuff, and, you know, it was hard. It was a difficult choice for us to make. And, and then one of the things I learned is that once we, you know, decide, he says, decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As Scripture says, they share freely and give generously to the poor, their good deeds will be remembered forever, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to, the bread to eat. Hmm. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. So here's what we're asking. As a body of believers, we're asking you to make four commitments, to add four things to your life in the next year to two years. The first three are definitely this next year. Will you commit to one hour of discipleship weekly? Will you commit to one hour of service every week? Will you commit to one person to pray about, invest in, and share the gospel message with? And will you commit to helping us pay off this debt that we have on our fellowship hall? I believe if we commit to those things, we are going to place ourselves in a prime position to see the gospel proclaimed from this place to the ends of the earth. Mm. Pastor Terry? We're going to stand uh, for our closing song today, and I believe you have a commitment card. Do we have commitment yes. cards there? And we're going to ask you to fill those out. And while the worship team is singing, uh, if you would, please, uh, if you feel comfortable, we would love for you to come up and put your commitment cards uh, in the basket uh, up here in the front. And we are also going to be taking offering at this particular time. And then uh, please hang around uh, right after that because we, uh, we have uh, an announcement from Brad uh, Marwood with uh, membership then and also those who have uh, gotten baptized today. But let's go ahead with our song at this particular time, and I'm going to pray with you as a congregation. God, thank you for today. Thank you for the vision. And we thank you what you have done within our church. We thank you for what you have done within our lives, God. God, now we press forward toward that mark, toward that goal, toward that prize. And God, I would pray that you would just pour out your blessings in this coming year. That we would function as the body is meant to function together. That we would grow together, that we would give together, that we would praise together, that we would worship together. We bless your name this day in Jesus' name. Amen.